nostalgia isn't what it used to be. For one thing, the general source of this feeling has changed. Whatever originally caused us to feel nostalgic is now shadowed, dwarfed by something new. But what's more, nostalgia has grown burdensome. It's almost inseparable from melancholy. Today, looking fondly on the past is more depressing than it is enjoyable. When it was coined, the word nostalgia was almost synonymous with homesickness, a composite of homecoming and pain. That is, pain expressed through longing. It meant an uncanny, even unhomely, return home. Later, it would mean a wistful longing for a simpler time in the past. But that was a long time ago. Now, when we speak of nostalgia, it's mostly in reference to lost objects, products, and places. Nostalgia finds its new voice through fast capitalism. I think it's easy to underestimate the significance of this. Never before has nostalgia been so widespread, affected so many. It is nothing less than the defining feature of our time. It was Marx who, in his first volume of Capital, described the way we assign an excessive amount of value to commodities with his theory of commodity fetishism. A commodity is never just a simple object that we value solely for its practical uses. The moment something becomes a commodity, it obtains a new social significance. It stands for something, says something about the individuals who associate with it. This extra quality we see in commodities fosters what Marx calls a network of social relations between things instead of social relations between people. Commodity fetishism is the difference between a plain white t-shirt sold at a lesser known store and the exact same shirt sold for $600 by a high-end designer label. The difference we see in the two shirts is a fiction, something entirely imaginary. There's nothing about the object itself that could justify its being valued beyond what it took to produce it and its utility. If we approach the things we buy strictly in regards to their utility, we find that most of it is totally unnecessary. And yet we still think it's all worth buying. The contradiction of life as a consumer is that you already know this. We know that commodities do not really possess the excessive amount of value we assign to them, but we behave as if we don't. The fact is, we enjoy commodities precisely because they are useless. There's an excess quality that we give commodities, something that shouldn't be there. It's this additional level of meaning that defines commodity fetishism. This invisible excess isn't limited to branding and social status, it also applies to nostalgia. Many of the places and products that you feel nostalgic for serve a very limited purpose outside of your nostalgia. Places like Toys R Us and American Malls were rendered obsolete by the practical value we now get out of sites like Amazon. These stores just couldn't compete, but we still feel nostalgic for them, not because they're suddenly useful to us, but because of something they represent. The items we feel nostalgic for only function in relation to our nostalgia. In the video game Night in the Woods, recent college dropout Mae Borowski comes home to resume her aimless lifestyle, but finds that things are not the same as she left them. Nobody has forgotten the horrible things she did to that one kid, bashing his face in with a bat during a softball match until it was almost unrecognizable. And they tell her as much. We haven't forgotten. But her friends are different. The town itself is different. The old mining operation that defined it since the very beginning is no longer functional. The glass factory lies abandoned. The small grocery store and surrounding shops all closed down so that the franchised supermarket could open up. And the party barn is crumpling because there isn't enough to celebrate. May's band plays inside what's left of that last one, music thumping deep within a corpse. After the acres of useless remaining parking lots fill with morning mist, they sparkle like the ocean, as much as synthetic seas can sparkle. And those who see it think to themselves that maybe there's still such a thing as poetry. The setting of Night in the Woods plays as much a role in the story as the characters do. In addition to these pre-existing changes, over the course of the game, multiple businesses are replaced with new ones. There are conversations about terrible pizzas, bankrupt malls, and the song played by May's band with the chorus, I just want to die anywhere else. It's an understatement to say that May's Midwestern hometown of Possum Springs is falling apart. May's friends, Greg and B, while they didn't go to college like she did, have grown up in ways she didn't. Greg, while still immature and reckless, 
is trying to reform himself so that he can move somewhere else with his boyfriend Angus. B was forced into early adulthood after the death of her mom and her dad's nervous collapse. She had dreams of going to college, but now she's stuck managing her father's business. But May? May is pretty much the same, and B resents her for it. Possum Springs is treated like a prison by so many of the people who live there. That's why May's return home is a real slap in the face. She was given a way out and she's back. Why? She won't say. She spends her time giving vague answers to the people who ask, and repeatedly telling her parents, who are stressed out about what this means for them financially, that they'll talk about it later. Meanwhile, B spends every weekend visiting a nearby town pretending to be a college student. Every night, back home, she falls asleep fantasizing about what it's like. Nostalgia runs deep in Possum Springs, but material nostalgia especially. May still experiences nostalgia as a longing for home. That's part of why she's back to begin with, of course. But that longing is overlaid with the images of past forms and fresh losses. There's an area of the game that touched me in a special way when I found it. It's one of the more obvious references to May's nostalgia. If you do a bit of platforming downtown, you can sneak through an open window into a space where the town stores what's left of its spring parade. Tucked in the very back, there's a large parade float. May is ecstatic when she sees it. She calls it her favorite anything from when she was a kid, but now it sits here, miracle rats in its stomach, a useless thing infested with new and vulgar life. She's right to call this place a tomb. For May, Mallard serves as an image for the good times. Even though it's presently useless and rotting, there's still something endearing about it. An excess just like the one Marx described. Though laid in its tomb, Mallard lives on. Its ghost haunts the place. And just like ghosts, nostalgia works hard to keep the past alive. There's no point in keeping the float around except as a reminder. But it's not just May. Possum Springs is generally infatuated with images of its past. And can you unhaunt a haunted house? The city council, who you can sometimes encounter while wandering about, cares more than anything about depicting Possum Springs favorably so as to attract the attention of the market. Whatever that means. There are a lot of murals and statues around town of the old miners back from when the town was thriving. When one of them is vandalized, it throws the council into a fit of rage and despair. But these memorials depict a fake past. The mining operation was in fact run as much on exploitation as it was tragedy. The depictions of the workers' glorious existence gives off the same feeling as Soviet propaganda posters. When May does find the person who vandalized the mural, they struggle angrily to voice their disappointment in its failed promise. It's a common feeling. When people see these murals and statues, they feel nothing but nostalgia for that life that never existed. There's something about Possum Springs that's more Possum Springs than the town itself. And the less Possum Springs resembles itself, the more uncanny it becomes for those that live there. It's a weird autumn. The days are getting colder and the nights are getting longer. Strange things begin to happen when the streets are empty. And there's something in the woods. Here we are, stranded in the desert, and nothing to drink but this delicious Coke. I've got to admit, I'm addicted to drinking this stuff, but Coke is not without its important philosophical lessons. In his film, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, the philosopher Slavoj Zizek insists that Coke is the perfect commodity the ultimate example of how commodities and desire function together. In capitalism, we find that we are actively compelled to enjoy. We see this in Coke. Coke, enjoy. In capitalism, if you are not enjoying, then the idea is that you are not doing it right. You must not be consuming enough, the right things in the right way. This is owed to the fact that the structure of capitalism is thoroughly defined by its elusive excesses. Here, taking this into account, 
Zizek analyzes Coke's old marketing slogans. Coke is the real thing, or Coke, that's it. What is that it, the real thing? Just like commodity fetishism, this it in Coke is not just another useful material property of Coke itself. The it in Coke is that excess which is the object cause of my desire. What the modern French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan called objet patita, or in English, little object of otherness. But besides sounding terrible in English, Lacan insisted that the term always remain untranslated so as to retain a special algebraic meaning. Objet patita is not an actual object. It is more like an objective, something that directs me towards something else. It's the constant feeling you have that something's missing. Objet a is the nothingness within you, your lack of fulfillment. But it's also the act of masking that void with what it inspires you to chase after. The endless attraction you feel towards certain objects or people is caused by your belief that having them will satisfy you. Objet patida is excess. It hangs around undefined as that additional quality that makes you desire otherwise useless objects. It's never just another literal property of the object itself. The idea is that objet a makes what you desire appear inexplicably special to you, even if it's totally shallow and superficial. Desire is never about merely satisfying your needs. I want to point out how similar this excess is to Marx's idea of commodity fetishism. Because we erroneously view objet a as an integral part of what we desire, we pursue it in the hopes that having it will give us back what's missing inside. But we can never truly achieve this excess objet, this it, the real thing. Coke is only a semblance of the true object of my desire. It holds the place of that which could finally come along and complete me. Coke is therefore the real thing in the precise sense that it is never truly the real thing. The paradox of Coke is that the more you drink, the thirstier you get. I am never wholly satisfied. A desire is never just a simple craving for a thing. It is also a desire for desire itself, the hope that I might continue to desire indefinitely. Perhaps we can summarize desire as a not yet. Please, not yet. I am not yet ready to have the thing of my desire and finally be satisfied. Not yet. I wish to continue to desire. And here is where the real pleasure of my desire comes from. The act of desiring itself. In David Foster Wallace's unusual masterpiece, Infinite Jest, a group of wheelchair-bound geopolitical terrorists hunt for a weapon of mass destruction to overthrow the government while U.S. agents scramble to stop them. The son of a famous film director gradually goes insane while attending his dead father's tennis academy, and various Boston residents recover from their substance abuse problems by attending alcoholic anonymous meetings. Each narrative is intertwined with all the others, orbiting the existence of the thing that ties them all together. A weapon of mass destruction, yes, but a rather unexpected one, a film. Its title, Infinite Jest. One cool evening, a man receives an unexpected copy of a film cartridge in the mail. He's a devout Sufi Muslim. He doesn't drink, and he most certainly does not do drugs. Therefore constrained to relax without chemical aid, Wallace tells us his unwinding options are severely limited. But there is one thing he loves. Every evening after work, he'll sit down in his expensive recliner his steaming dinner positioned on a tray just below his chin so he can eat without the need to look away, and he'll compulsively binge film after film on the teleputer until he falls asleep. That's why it's no surprise that on this particular evening, an evening where he finds himself entirely out of film cartridges, he's quick to seize the opportunity that this unmarked cartridge offers him. He sits down in that expensive, special recliner and boots up the film. The next day, April 2nd, at 1.45 a.m., when his wife returns from her permitted Muslim woman's tennis match, she finds him very much still awake, watching, and she sees the state of his eyes, and now soiled recliner, an uneaten dinner, and she cries out, shaking him, trying to rouse him. He doesn't even notice her. But eventually, she looks up at his face, frozen in the contortions of ecstasy, and naturally follows his gaze to the teleputer where the film has now been set to loop indefinitely. 
it will be the end of her. They're the first ones exposed to the film, Infinite Jest, the first ones to uncover its true nature, a film so entertaining you lose interest in everything else. They die this way, watching it endlessly, glued to the screen, but they die happily, and yet their actual deaths are but a mere formality. Later, as the bodies begin to rot, their corpses will still be watching. Drive is the psychological force which, la contente, stands in opposition to desire. If desire is a not yet, then drive is the cry for more of the same. Enough is never enough. It can be seen in those repeated compulsive behaviors which bring about great pleasure, but also great disturbance to one's life. Lacan's concept of drive shares some of the features of Freud's death drive, which Freud first introduced in his essay Beyond the Pleasure Principle. Freud proposed that in addition to the psyche's life drive, there was also a drive towards self-annihilation. He developed this theory from the way World War I veterans would re-experience or repeat their trauma as a compulsion to repeat something past the point of any conceivable pleasure. Although Freud adamantly stood by this conceptualization of the death drive for the rest of his life, it was widely rejected, and honestly, not without good reason. I've even tried to work with the idea before, while researching for my video on the desire to not exist of all things, but still without any success. Enter Lacan. Later into his career, Lacan taught that the death drive is a part of every drive, not as an unconscious death wish, but as a compulsion to enter into an endless, repetitive state. Unlike desire, drive isn't oriented towards the impossible fulfillment of a lack. It repeating itself is its only goal. This is one half of what we see in the infinitely entertaining film of Infinite Jest. Its viewers simply must repeat it. Watching it again and again and again is all that matters to them. But that's not the only way the film exemplifies the drive, nor the only thing drive has in common with the death drive. The psychical nature of drive is its own source of enjoyment. But when the repetition of our behavior goes beyond what is pleasurable, beyond the pleasure principle, we simultaneously enter into the realm of surplus enjoyment, of pleasure in pain. This pain and the pleasure experienced as a result of it is again the byproduct of excess. In this case, an excess of enjoyment. A common example of this aspect of the drive is the moment when, after stuffing yourself full of a satisfying meal, you continue to eat to the point that it hurts, but it feels so good precisely because of how much you actually ate. Or suppose how it always seems like there's room for dessert, the excess to a meal, until you eat it and suddenly everything seems so unbearable, but yet all the more enjoyable. And, of course, we see this again in Infinite Jest. The ultimate pleasures are delivered to us by what destroys us. There's a limit to how much of this our body can actually endure. The drive ignores this limit. The death drive inherent to every drive demands a different kind of body, one that could sustain its endless repetition. In this sense, the death drive is undead, an excess of life beyond life persist inside things even after their demise only because it's unable to recognize that its host is already dead. But another paradox, a body able to withstand the damage of the repeating loop wouldn't be able to experience the surplus enjoyment of the drive anyway. We can only experience it when we go past our limitations into the realm of pain. We cannot actually have our cake and eat it too. This internal contradiction is what makes the functioning of the drive possible as something impossible. Surplus enjoyment is not simply enjoyment and then something more. It is only enjoyment because of the surplus, because it's been pushed to the extreme. Let's take another drink of Coke. In the imagined future of Infinite Jest, years are referred to by the name of their corporate sponsor, Entire 365-day periods of time are purchased as advertising space, like Super Bowl commercials. Most of the events in the novel take place in the year of the depend adult undergarment. It's absurd in the scary way that the most real things are. Already, so much of our perception of the passing of time is dominated by commodities. Not just on a generational scale, but an annual. In America, when you want to know what month it is, you need only look to the supermarket shelves. 
drive has a funny relationship with time. We know that desire is linear, guided by a lack towards an object that holds the place of objet d'art. Lacan's son-in-law, Jacques-Holland Miller, conceived of this lack as something quantifiable because it presupposes a space that we can say is empty. That space is missing something to fill it. Drive, on the other hand, he says, circles around a hole, like a black hole, a pure negativity, where the order of space itself breaks down. Drive thus adheres to the idea that the shortest distance to an endpoint is not a straight line, but a curve. If we draw two dots on a piece of paper, imagining one is where we start and the other is where we want to end up at, we could draw a straight line between the two. Or we could curve the piece of paper and stab a hole through it. Beginning and end, here and there, thus occupy the same point in time. This is one reason why drive, whose only aim is to repeat itself, is curved. It's not trying to get anywhere. It's already there, simply by being here. The objective of the drive is to exist in the same moment forever, when this moment is the next moment, and will be the next moment after that until the end of eternity. It's like time stops. The circulation of the drive is how it almost achieves this dream. There are, however, certain products that we think will be around forever, and then one day they're gone. But the disappearance of the things we love isn't always a literal disappearance. Think of the food you had as a kid that no longer tastes the same. Sometimes this can be explained by some line of scientific reasoning about how your body itself has changed with time, but sometimes that isn't it. There's a microwavable pizza for one that I used to eat all the time as a kid. It had egg and bacon on it with this creamy cheese that was amazing. It was my go-to breakfast for years. It was awesome, man. I loved that pizza. But then one day, years later, I took a bite and it tasted different. They changed the cheese or something. It was probably cheaper to produce that way, but it totally ruined it for me. Now, not only do I no longer have any inclination towards it, it's the last thing I would want to eat in the morning. And I was reminded by this change that my childhood was dying. The commodities I desire have something about them that makes them seem more special than they are. And that would be objet patita. I've talked about objet a as an excess, lack, and the cause of desire. But we can also think of it as that which is in something more than the thing itself. Remember, nostalgia is the uncanny return home. In the case of Night in the Woods, literally. It's our return to what's familiar, only to find that it's been changed in one crucial regard. It lacks the abstract thing that perfectly defined it.
complaint that things are no longer what they used to be. This complaint is actually the very way nostalgia is produced. We feel nostalgic when our expression of the pain of our loss is also a source of pleasure. Of course, not all nostalgia is the nostalgia for lost commodities. It's a natural part of human psychology, I like to think. But I believe this massive new landscape of consumer nostalgia can only be attributed to the relentless thrust of capitalism. The role of capitalism here can be understood by means of a metaphor in which, during a sexual act, a woman asks for more, meaning more of the same thing, to which her partner responds by going harder, faster, frustrating her end of the experience. Why does he do this? It isn't because, as is usually the case, he's confused about what she means. It's also because it's more pleasurable for him to do it his way. What we see here is a clash between two drives, her drive for more of the same experience and his drive for an increasingly elevated one, for surplus. We should notice that this particular partner's enjoyment is only possible at her expense when her enjoyment has been prohibited. This is translated first in Marx with his notion of surplus value, which is what he called the profit capitalists generate by paying workers less than the value they provide to their labor. Generating more and more profit is what defines the drive of capitalism. As Marx put it, the circulation of money as capital is an end in itself, for the expansion of value takes place only within this constantly renewed movement. The circulation of capital therefore has no limits. Capitalists themselves are amongst the first to tell you that money is never made, it is taken. What they mean is that money can only be made via its circulation as capital. They're telling you a lot more than they mean to. But the expansion of profit also happens to rely on the sacrifice of our enjoyment as consumers. When I played Minecraft as a kid, I never wanted to stop. I'd play all day during the summer, and some nights I'd keep playing on my laptop in my room until the sun began to rise. When I got into bed, I would still be thinking of my builds. It was what I lived for, for a time. But one day, maybe not one in particular, it stopped being fun. The game itself had changed. My wish for more of the same had been answered with new features, a bigger player base, all of which was inevitable. Of course, the game was going to keep evolving, but if it were up to me, I would have kept it the same. Those days were exhilarating, and now they're gone. I get more of a kick now thinking about playing Minecraft than I do booting up the game and running around before ultimately realizing that it just isn't the same. It never will be. But even when I do boot up the version of the game that I used to play, the original, even then there's something missing. Even the original has been rendered meaningless by change. This is the profound contradiction in the capitalist instruction to enjoy. Enjoyment is the consumer's duty, but the true source of our enjoyment has been taken from us and is constantly being taken from us again. Except this is exactly what makes desire and nostalgia possible. Objet patita isn't just an object that we once had and then lost, it emerges only as being lost. It is the lostness of our enjoyment. It never existed except as something always already missing. Hence why nostalgia exists only in retrospect, when things are no longer the same, no longer caught in the repetition of the drive. Our disappointment with the relentless thrust of capitalism, in so much that it mutilates and disfigures everything we formerly used to recognize, is what turns us towards our past pleasures and causes us to feel nostalgic. Nostalgia wouldn't exist the way it presently does if, when we wished for more of the same, capitalism responded with something other than harder, faster production. Once again, this loss is necessary for capitalism to function. Because I am compelled to enjoy and find myself unable to, I continue to consume. This is what more moderate theorists miss. What we perceive as the aberrations of capitalism are actually the very things that make the system at all possible. Its impossibility is the condition of its possibility because in its most basic formulation, it's nothing but the drive. The flaws of capitalism cannot be amended without inevitably meaning the annihilation of the system itself. One of the problems with capitalism is climate change, which is why I'm proud to tell you that this video is sponsored by Ren. Okay, hear me out. I actually think this is super cool. Ren is a public benefit corporation that allows you to calculate your carbon footprint and then offset it by funding projects around the world that help reduce the carbon in the atmosphere. A lot of brands use promises of ecological preservation to ease your guilt in buying their products. 
Getting involved in helping the climate crisis feels like screaming at the characters in a horror film not to go into the basement. We feel very involved, but accomplish nothing. What I like about Ren, and what made me reach out to them in the first place, is how many details they give you on the projects you back. Every month you get a detailed report on everything you accomplished together, with pictures, and the impact those projects have had. You get to choose which projects to back, and there are a lot of super cool ones. The first people who sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Check it out. It's going to take a lot more than just these projects to solve the climate crisis. Ren isn't the end-all, be-all solution. To its credit, it doesn't claim to be. But it has plans to do more with your support. And in the meantime, it offers you a way to make a real difference without asking for more than you can actually give. I really believe in their mission. It isn't the case that we should make a return to some era of human history where we did not operate under a certain excess, where if you were thirsty, you drank water and not coke. No, we cannot return to that. The excess lives with us forever. Shopping bags are little ghosts of grocery stores, haunting everywhere else. All of life today takes place within the context of capitalism. There's nothing it doesn't affect. There is a specter which now haunts us all. The specter of communism. So all we are left with is our desire. But what happens when we repeat the past? The answer is bleak but simple. We compulsively prolong the lifespan of the world past what's possible while gaining back none of our past enjoyment. We watch the things we love crumble and rot and command them to take another step forward as undead husks. We hate the result, but we do it anyway. This is drive understood from the perspective of one who desires, an attempt to regain something lost through its repetition. But that was never the point of the drive. This is why we should think of the death drive as being undead through desire. The drive itself does not yet recognize it as dead. Our enjoyment doesn't yet recognize it as impossible. So all we are left with is our desire. But what happens when we repeat the past? In his book, Spectres of Marx, the philosopher Jacques Derrida introduced his concept of hauntology. The word itself is a clever pun. It combines the French word to haunt with ontology, the field of philosophy that examines being itself. The resulting word, ontology, sounds very similar to ontology. That silent H is what makes all the difference. It's clever because hauntology observes how something absent can affect what's present, especially as this pertains to the ghosts of old ideas and lost futures. Spectres of Marx devotes a portion of its pages to discussing Shakespeare's Hamlet, particularly Hamlet's phrase, the time's out of joint. Hamlet probably means his time, the state of the world at the time the play is taking place. But the more general idea of time being out of joint, of undead pasts and lost futures, can tell us a lot about nostalgia and the uncanny. Derrida makes the remark that in the play, it isn't just time that's out of joint. Hamlet himself is out of joint. He swears against his misfortune, and this misfortune is unending because it is nothing other than himself. He's out of joint because he curses his mission to set things right, to resolve the matters of the previous generation. The heavy burden of the present affects us all. The philosopher Martin Heidegger argued that one is thrown into existence. The impossibility of understanding what it means to exist indicates the traumatic nature of existence. But existence in the world also means existence in the flow of time. The feeling of being thrown into one's place in history indicates another existential trauma. As Marx put it, the tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. But time is not only out of joint in the sense of history. The actual temporality of time is too. While our drive as consumers is for more of the same, a compulsion to repeat the same moment forever, eventually we're prohibited from doing so. But the loss of that eternal enjoyment also creates our perception of time. What was once here is no longer here. The past didn't exist before we stepped out of the cycle of the drive because every moment was the same moment. Our sense of time exists only by being out of joint, as a broken circle now stretched forward and back. This also extends to nostalgia, which emerges only when something has already been lost. Time itself is traumatic. We only ever experience time as a series of losses. The very definition of time, the only possible way you can measure it, is change. We sometimes try to escape our losses by repeating the past, but this cannot satisfy us. It won't prevent our future losses either. 
In his later discussions of death drive, Lacan spoke of it as a space between two deaths. This space is the land of the living dead, a land inhabited by ghosts without bodies and bodies without souls. It is also where hauntology is most relevant. Derrida has shown us that this space can only exist when time is out of joint. The space itself is uncanny, supernatural. This is what's become of so many of the great cultural artifacts of the past few decades. The idea of the remake has become notorious in recent years. Certain franchises don't seem to know how to stay dead. They persist in an uncanny, empty way, and so we grow ever more nostalgic. Possum Springs suffers from the same problem. After the new highway was built, the old road that used to lead traffic through town wasn't used anymore. Possum Springs was forgotten. The city council wants things to return to how they think they used to be, but the old tricks aren't working anymore. The council is living in the past, and a fake past at that. You can never go back to something that never existed. May's personal life functions in a similar way. She's still trying to resurrect her dead childhood, force it to walk. At the same time, May spends a lot of time trying to convince people that she's an adult. And she's old enough to be, sure, but if she really was an adult, it wouldn't feel like she's not. The entire game you treat the town like a huge playground, which is how May sees it. Every day is the same for her. She wakes up late, talks to folks around town, hangs out with her friends, and then goes to sleep. It's her feverish attempt to relive her childhood. She does successfully go through the motions, but it doesn't have the same result. She doesn't quite understand yet that time has moved forward. Pausing it again is an impossible state of being. Monstrous existence. Some of the people who talk about this game look at May the way B does. The problems expressed by the other characters in Possum Springs are real problems. To see May initially be so dismissive of those problems is frankly annoying. It's true that May acts incredibly selfish, naive, and childish most of the time, but really she's just confused. She wants to be a good person, but doesn't know how. But by kicking around Possum Springs every day, May encounters other people who not only live in a forgotten town, but have also themselves been forgotten by the forgotten town. The more you seek out the hidden places other, less motivated players would miss, the more you're rewarded with new perspectives on Possum Springs itself. These other perspectives gradually help May refine her own. On Halloween, May witnesses a kidnapping and chases after the kidnapper. But when they seemingly phase through a fence, she loses them and tells everybody that she saw a ghost. She's been having strange dreams about eldritch gods, a band of ghosts, and fish and cities and trains made of stars. Something inexplicable and horrifying out there calls to her, splits her head open with searing, hot pain. She feels an unending anxiety about whatever is happening, but she can't help but heed that call as she races after the answer of what happened that night. She just knows this ghost and her dreams are connected. Then she spends a night in the woods, comes face to face with an impossible world-ending truth. May's anxiety defines the second half of the game. At first, it isn't obvious what May is anxious about, exactly. You'd be forgiven if you assumed it was about the kidnapping, generally a rather traumatizing thing to watch happen, but May's anxiety has been unfurling even in the first half of the game. Even before the kidnapping, she's been having those dreams. They give her a foreboding sense of doom, a premonition that something bad is destined to happen. She more or less shrugs it off at first, but the feeling still stands over her like an omen. There's something rotten in the state of Possum Springs. The time is out of joint. The kidnapping only sends her anxiety into overdrive. It isn't until later that we really figure out what May's going through, but even then, it still is entirely clear. See, May's anxiety is simultaneously her fear of being forgotten, identity crisis, doubts about the existence of God, a symptom of her larger mental health issues, and yes, something that arises in her uncanny encounters with the supernatural. Abigail Nussbaum writes in her article in the game that Night in the Woods layers the personal, the political, and the supernatural, or uncanny, until ultimately we understand that they're the same thing. I totally agree. In the scenes that pertain to May's anxiety, there are often two or more of these elements present. There's a later game sequence that shows what I mean. It's one of my favorites. In her final dream, May finds herself in a desert made of stardust. Dunes roll off a new infinity. At a dark horizon, they combine with the sky and dissipate into a blur. She wanders for a bit, 
There's rubble and ruins and driftwood in the sand. The sky trembles and flashes overhead with the reverberating death of far-off galaxies. This is all that's left at the end of everything. And then there's God. They're just laying there. Apathetic. Distant. Grand. But God claims not to be God and tells no lie. Seconds ago, little creatures are coming to me and they are asking if I am God. And I am asking what God is and they are telling me and I am not this God. And this God is nowhere. Moments ago was the beginning and I am here then and here now and there is nowhere for this God to be hiding. They speak of a great beast who wandered the sands and then tore a hole in the sky and disappeared. They warn May that she's drifting out into that abyss. May asks them, if nothing matters, what about my friends, my home? What about the trees and fall and the leaves? Bare existence, meaning nothing. You are atoms, and your atoms are not caring if you are existing. The universe is forgetting you, and I am remembering you, but not because I am caring. The beginning is moments ago, the end is moments away. There is no time to forget before everything is forgotten. Then God climbs into the air and collapses the sky. May's anxiety is ultimately an existential anxiety. God's mentions of the annihilation of the future and the forgetfulness of the universe reflect this. Hauntology is not just about undead pasts. The space between the two deaths can also erupt into melancholy. Freud defines melancholy through its opposition to mourning. He claimed that when you're in mourning, you are aware of what's been lost. In the case of melancholy, it's totally ambiguous, but you still feel like you've lost something. Melancholy is thus, by Freud's approximation, the failure to mourn. Freud understood melancholy as a staged loss, meaning that you foresee a future loss and respond to it as if it's already happened. However, if there's something being treated as if it was already lost, then how is it possible that, at the same time, you're oblivious to what that is? The reason for this is that what's been treated as lost has never actually been lost. According to Zizek, the melancholic perceives what is lacking as what is lost. Objet patida, the lost object that emerges only as already lost, the object cause of desire, is a lack. Recall Miller's classification. Lack is an actually existing nothing, a measurable emptiness. Melancholy interprets this lack as if it was instead an object that was once possessed and then lost. This way, the melancholic is able to act as if they once had the thing they claim is missing. This is also the way desire works. But there's one more nauseating reversal left. The only way to possess something we never had, something that has never existed except as something already lost, is to treat what we still have as if it's already gone. Kind of like when you realize that one day the people you love are going to die, and that realization makes you feel sad now, as if they were already gone. Melancholy isn't a failure to mourn. Instead, it's mourning pushed to the extreme. The purpose of melancholy isn't to mourn your losses so that you can accept their absence, it's to perpetually mourn the things that still exist. Melancholy is mourning for the sake of mourning. As long as what you're mourning has not yet been lost, you can continue to mourn. You can derive pleasure from the very act of mourning. May's feelings of melancholy closely align with Mark Fisher's idea of a lost future as discussed in his book on hauntology, Ghosts of My Life. Instead of there being a future loss, the future is itself lost. Of course, you never really had a future, but by declaring that it's been lost, you can act as if you once did. Fisher's complaint is that there's some kind of cultural inertia that has resulted in the slow cancellation of the future. He says that time, or rather the progression of Western culture, has stopped a fact that has been masked by the superficial innovation of capitalism. It isn't that the old forms have disappeared, but that they haven't. The world of tomorrow is still the world of yesterday. It isn't a totally unfamiliar world. I can name most everything in it, but it is a world devoid of meaning. When Fisher wrote his book in 2013, he claimed that it feels like we haven't yet entered the 21st century. This is some uncanny twilight zone, a liminal space between then and there. The time is out of joint. What Fisher fails to notice is that it isn't that time has stopped, but that it's kept moving forward. The drive of capitalism may look like the systems reliving the same moment forever, but we're the ones feeling the effects. A common hasty conclusion is that the stagnation of the present is the fault of consumers. To paraphrase Bethesda's Todd Howard in reference to the perpetual re-release of Skyrim, if you don't like it, why do you keep buying it? 
The unspoken promise here being that if consumers stop buying the things they don't like, that if we can simply stop falling prey to our nostalgia, that we can stop being stuck in the present and finally march on together into the future. Simply put, vote with your dollar. But for one thing, this is a fantastic trick. It obscures the drive of capitalism so that the only other thing left to condemn is the desire of the consumer. But we are only consumers when there is already capitalism. Our role as consumers doesn't create capitalism, just as consumers do not create their own nostalgia. Even so, ideology always uses nostalgia to reinforce itself. Nostalgia appears to present us with a way out of the mundanity of the present, but in fact it actually reinforces the political conditions that make the present so miserable. It's one of the ways that capitalism is able to convert the critiques against it into fuel. Walter Benjamin discusses this phenomenon in his essay The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. He claims that before its mass reproduction, art possessed a special historical identity. You can make a million copies of the Mona Lisa, but these copies would be missing the cultural significance of the original. Not only that, but you'd also chip away at what makes the original Mona Lisa so meaningful. And that's where we find ourselves now. Nothing feels real anymore. 90s fashion trends may not be the same as the Mona Lisa, but the selling point for the reproduction of such commodities is the sense of cultural fullness we associate with that time. That's why we buy into our nostalgia. Of course, this is always disappointing, and it gives rise to uncanny renditions. But rather than discouraging me from my nostalgia, I only feel more nostalgic as a result. But our deflation of expectations, our lack of fulfillment to contemporary society, is indicative of a much larger issue. Nostalgia distracts us from the real source of our social and political suffering. Fisher's book shows how the personal is the political is the supernatural. My individual nostalgia is in conversation with my political ideology. Together, they suspend the supernatural gap that makes them possible. Inspectors of Marx, Derrida concerns himself not with Marx the man, but the certain spirit of Marxism. This is Marxism devoid of the forms of action that Marx himself advised, the remaining fundamental core of Marxist ideology. It isn't that this reduction is necessary for a successful future implementation of Marxism, that the original insufficient forms ought to be replaced with new and better ones, but that the future redemption offered to us by Marxism is blocked by any sort of determinate measures, any attempt to bring about the so-called really existing Marxist state. Ideology is the imperfect way we understand the world, and the illusory ways we think we can make it better. It looks towards the future implementation of its appraised systems the same way Christians see Judgment Day. Ideology presupposes some future event where all of the humble suffering of the past will finally be worth it. The call for justice will finally have been answered. All specters are at their core this call for immediate justice. Socialism, democracy, and all the rest is only ever to come. The promised messianic future will only ever remain a promise because of the nature of ideology. According to the pattern of desire, Ideology operates under the premise that there's a socialism more socialist than any attempt at socialism. Sure, the Soviet Union claimed to be communist, but let's be honest, that wasn't really communism. This socialism is the real thing, but the true socialism, or democracy, is not simply one that promises to arrive in the future, but one that never actually does. There's always something to postpone it. Ideology operates as a messianism without the actuality of a messiah. Zizek states that the to come of democracy is not just some frivolous quirk of democracy, but its innermost reality. Contrary to what most people believe, totalitarianism is not what develops when it's formally declared that we have no more democracy. As the Soviet Union showed, the moment democracy is no longer a promised future, but pretends to have been fully actualized in the present, it is then no longer democracy but totalitarianism. All sorts of horrors are permissible when you see yourself as the guardian of a supreme good. In the cases of both the personal and the political, we source the loss of our future from the future loss of what still exists. In other words, the two are the same thing. Our loss of the future is also the loss we see in the future. And what could this better apply to than the hope for life outside of capitalism? The melancholic treats the situation as if it were irredeemably hopeless. I claim the opposite of Fisher. A lost future is still a nostalgia for the past, a past that never truly happened the way we remember it. This is projected into the future as the thing that will redeem us from the horrors of the present. 
Ironically, Fisher's own ideology within these pages resembles his desire to return to a past when the future was still available. But we can only ever achieve our desired future if we let go of our tendency to hold on to old ideas. This feeling of fate, of being set on a path you can't escape until its end, is also prevalent in Night in the Woods. It's ironically the game's supernatural elements that best illustrate for us the real-world nature of nostalgia, ideology, and their relationship to anxiety. There's an area in the magnificent game, Disco Elysium, that I think about a lot. It reminds me quite a lot of Night in the Woods. Disco Elysium is a game full of ideas, so its apparent core messages don't seem to be explicit statements, but the process of thinking itself. It's a brilliant mosaic of ideologies and theory, underneath which we find chilling examples of real-world suffering. Just like its main character, you have to discover for yourself where you stand amongst it all. The game's setting, Martinez, has a long and complicated history. It is war-torn, as much by the recent fire of artillery shells as by its competing schools of thought. After a failed attempt to implement communism, it now sags with poverty under the added weight of neoliberal capitalism. It largely represents the Eastern European home of the game's developers. Every school of thought and government has failed in the city, but I love it nonetheless. It belongs to me as much as it belongs to you. Like Possum Springs, Martinez too is haunted by parts of the past that won't stay dead. The mark of the supernatural has been most blatantly placed on its doomed commercial area. When you first enter the bookstore that's a part of this larger building, you'll notice the anxiety of its owner. She clutches a mysterious fish head charm around her neck, asks you in a shrill voice, Please take responsibility for the energy you bring into this space. If you mention her shivering daughter out front, she asks you how compelled you were to buy a book after speaking to her. She'll judge the worth of her daughter on your response. If she notices you doing anything other than look at her books, this woman will plead with you to return your gaze there. The books are all you care about! She commands you to enjoy. But what on earth is she so anxious about? As far as she's concerned, the building is cursed. There is a curse, and there is an entity she blames for it. When you tear open the curtain in the corner and break down the door behind it, you'll find that the rest of the building is a mausoleum for the remains of failed startups. The situation doesn't look good. Even you begin to believe there's something wrong with the place. There are certain corners, in any city or town, where it seems like every business set up there inevitably fails. Even the language we use reflects something resembling superstition. They were destined to fail the moment they opened up there. The more you chase the supernatural, the more it feels like it's chasing you. And it's close. Heart-stoppingly close. And what is the supernatural if not the Lacanian real? Lacan described his category of the real as anything impossible, anything that doesn't really exist, but still has a traumatic impact on the entire structure of social reality. In fact, the only way to discern the real is through the stain it leaves behind, the abnormal way it affects everything that orbits around it. It might be confusing to call the real pure reality and then say that it doesn't exist, but think of it this way. When you take away reality, what you're left with is not nothing, but the thing that made reality possible. We find the real waiting for us. This is why Lacan says that the real is that which always returns to its place. It's the only thing that exists when you take away reality. It's what must necessarily cease to exist once you bring reality back. The non-existence of the real makes reality possible. When we define the real this way, it becomes obvious that it's a perfect description of the impossible enjoyment of the drive, the one that we feel nostalgic for. Lacan calls anxiety the lack of a lack. What he means is that anxiety indicates the real coming into existence, which entails the collapse of reality. When you find the entity implicated with the curse, she turns out not to be the malignant witch that Planes told you she would be, but a soft-spoken woman crafting dice in a huge industrial chimney. Despite the other dozens of failed businesses that have swept like a cold draft through the building, she's survived. Niha has spent the last 14 years in this chimney, so it's been refurbished to feel a little bit more like home. The rare materials she uses to craft her dice protrude from the wall like iridescent geodes of color. Although she's painted over the walls, you can still see the coal stains on the bricks. The ocean wind slices through the air overhead, 
rattling the ceiling. Living here has directly exposed her to the absurd business ventures whose failures left a dark stain on the building. There was a boxing club meant to help steer the impoverished children away from drugs and crime that only made things worse. The rumor went around that its punching bag was filled with amphetamines. Then there was the business promising to repair windows at any hour of the day that was really just a front for its eroticized radio broadcast of real murders with real victims. And finally, an ice cream company that tried to sell its ice cream to children from a terrifying red-eyed taxidermied bear whose design was revealed to its owner during a trip off silicon gel packets. He called it Megatherian, his vision beast. And yet, Niha still remains, content in the chimney, working with a childlike passion. Her attitude is in complete juxtaposition to Planet's. There is no curse, she says, only capitalism. She calls the failure of the other tenants a part of our precarious world. As you yourself later conclude, The only way to load the dice is to keep on fighting. But here we find ourselves dipping once again into mysticism. We rely on fate to explain the existence of capitalism. This is just the way things are. The supernatural is the political. In his theses on history, Walter Benjamin conceived of history as a written text, a series of events that always will have been. Between the past and the future is the gap of the present, a traumatic inner space whose significance, like trauma, can only be entirely determined after it has already happened, after it's been assigned its place in history at which point it will become what it always already was. We can look at a lot of history in hindsight and claim that, of course, what happened was going to turn out that way. Of course, selling ice cream from the inside of a taxidermied bear was going to end poorly. All the signs were there. The web of influence suddenly seemed so clear. But the signs only really became signs after all of it was over. While history does seem inevitable, like it was fated to happen that way. This isn't how we should look at the present. That would make you a melancholic. And yet, so many of us are. Capitalism has convinced us to believe in its promise of progress. So when we look back at history and then look at how things are now, we feel like, yeah, that's progress. Except what looks like progress feels like the continual loss of something better. The progress of capitalism is not real progress, but capitalism for capitalism's sake the endless circulation of capital. It feels useless to rebel. The future, the alternate path, has already been lost. As Fisher wrote in one of his other books, Capitalist Realism, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is the end of capitalism. Capitalism is inseparable from reality. In The Critique of Violence, Benjamin explains how this is possible through his concept of mythic violence his term for the way that malignant economic and political power has asserted itself over all human life, projecting a form of authority out into the world that then becomes accepted as reality itself. It's mythic in the sense that we might also call it supernatural. There isn't any actual basis for the powers of liberalism and capitalism. Their right to rule is self-proclaimed and then increasingly naturalized so that their ideologies appear commonsensical, inescapable, a byproduct of fate itself. The only justification for the existence of capitalism is that it already exists. Mythic violence is violent because, without a genuine basis for its authority, these economic and political powers must endlessly strike out, exploiting and destroying in tireless repetition in order to establish their power and their reality. Benjamin's claim is that capitalism is little more than this violence. Systems are supposed to be tools, but capitalism exists only for its own sake. Despite the provocative nature of the term, mythic violence doesn't mean outright physical violence. The German word that Benjamin uses can also be translated as projection or force. That makes a lot more sense considering his main point is on how capitalism and the government have used the law in a way that protects themselves instead of public welfare. This idea that capitalism is inseparable from reality works as an answer to the real. The impossibility of capitalism itself why we believe capitalism to be necessary, really, why we view it as fate, is because of our total shock at its own impossible existence. The impossible always seems to finally, and not suddenly, happen, just like the curse of the doomed commercial area. 
The idea of a curse, or similarly, of the free market doing its job, hides how capitalism affects our life in ways we could never expect. When the franchised supermarket opened up in Possum Springs, that wasn't the free market doing its job. Almost nobody has any money in Martinez or Possum Springs to begin with. In the final analysis, no business is truly thriving. Niha herself admits that she really only makes enough to get by. But the means whereby capitalism asserts itself also dictates our individual fates. A part of Lacan's conceptualization of objet d'art that I haven't yet discussed is that your desire is the other's desire. What that means is that your desire works in the way that you believe will make you generally desirable. So all desire is the chase for the lost object that never existed, a desire for desire itself, and a desire to be recognized. That's why Lacan claims that desire is fundamentally a matter of identity. Simply by being a member of society, you always already have something representing you for you. It's as fundamental as your own name, what defines you as yourself to others. But whatever represents you only works if you recognize yourself through it. A certain idea from the political philosopher Louis Althusser tries to explain at what point we recognize ourselves in our place in society. His famous example is of a police officer who yells out in your direction. When you turn around, you implicate yourself as the subject of their attention because you thought they were referring to you and not somebody else. Included in the recognition of myself and what represents me is the misunderstanding that what represents me is me. But like your own name, you've never really been given the chance to decide how you'll recognize yourself. You just sort of do. You're always already a subject. You're treated as if you'll recognize yourself in the call before the call ever goes out. So you do. I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. I should know, sir. I've always been here. We see this process working in every circle of social life, like consumerism, for example. Ads treat us like we're a consumer before we ever recognize ourselves as one. So when you go out and consume, you only confirm that you are a consumer all along. The personalized ads of the internet are especially interesting because they even tell you what you enjoy before you confirm that they're right. If the ad does what it's supposed to, that is what you enjoy because you answer the call of the ad and go and buy the product. In the sphere of culture, interpolation leads us to believe that our culture's values are our own, while in fact they have always been handed to us by our culture. Because individuals can literally only recognize themselves as the subjects of their society's dominant ideology, they become complicit in their own domination. Their subjugation is no longer limited to the law and its mythic violence, it is ingrained into the very fabric of social reality itself. As Zizek has famously declared, Ideology is strong precisely because it is no longer experienced as ideology. We feel free because we lack the very language to articulate our unfreedom. Our status as subjects exposes the paradox of free choice. As it stands in every community, you are allowed the freedom to choose on the condition that you choose the right thing, that being whatever is immediately given to you. But you have to do it because you want to. It has to be because you are free to choose it. Except. If you ever choose something other than this right choice, you lose the ability to choose at all. We see this in the cliché of many coming-of-age stories. It even happens in Night in the Woods. If you really were my daughter, you'd do what we had already decided for you. The point is that you aren't ever really presented with a choice. You are always already treated as if you've already chosen. May has always already been the first Borowski to go to college, even before she ever went to college. In exactly the same way, I never really get the opportunity to choose for myself if I want to enter society, or this particular society, in this particular way. I am always already a member of this society. Our desire means that we're also the subject of the desire of the other. We're always trying to answer the call for what the other desires before it goes out. We want to be the real thing. We've taken the external expectations already given to us and internalized them as the way we desire the same way Althusser described. There really isn't a better way to describe the feeling of fate than as a set of choices you've already made. 
It feels like the script was already written and you're simply supposed to follow it. This is what's really happening during May's fight with her mom about college. By always already having been the first Borowski to go to college, May's always been what the other Borowskis never were. Because if you want to be the thing the other desires, you need to be the thing the other lacks. Even though her parents were projecting their own desires onto her, she tried to live up to them. She wanted to make her parents proud. But May doesn't feel like college was where she was supposed to be. She's hoping that her mom can love her even though she's different from what she wants. Later into the game, she finally opens up to her friends about what she's been going through. Not just about her headaches and the ghosts they've been hunting, but something that's plagued her for years. When she horrifically beat down that kid during a softball match, it wasn't because she had anger issues like everyone said. It was something else. A deep sadness, a feeling of emptiness. It formed inside of her one day when she was playing a game on her laptop and then something broke. She felt like she knew the characters. They felt like real people, but the illusion was lifted and suddenly all they were was a collection of pixels. The things they said were just lines somebody else had written for them. The whole act of playing the game became meaningless, reduced to the sad image of her alone in her room, engaging with the same lines of code as everybody else. But then that realization flooded out of the screen into real life. The tree she grew up seeing outside her window was suddenly just a thing, a meaningless formation of matter. And the people around her too, moving bulks of stuff, their lines already written, like there was nothing inside of them. And she felt a devastating loneliness, a loneliness that hasn't gone away. Everything she saw in the world was made up of only shapes, moving in a way that meant nothing to her. Nothing in the universe mattered anymore. Nothing was there for her. Monstrous existence. That sadness spilled over into anxiety, and then anger, and then violence. The day of the match, when she stepped up to bat, she disconnected. When she came to, there was blood all over the field and she was on top of a kid she hardly knew, swinging a metal bat. And there were shapes, hundreds of glistening red shapes coating the grass. Her parents sent her to the town's only therapist, a country doctor who specialized in, well, everything. And of course that didn't help. When she went to college, it was all she felt every day. She could hardly even make it out of her room. Some have suggested that May has depersonalization, derealization disorder. But I don't have the credentials to confirm that, and I certainly haven't done the research I would need to in order to even talk about it. However, Heidegger talks about this exact kind of experience in his essay, What is Metaphysics?, wherein he sets out to conceptualize absolute nothingness. He argues that the only way to grasp nothingness is through anxiety. While our immediate impulse to understand nothingness is to subtract all of reality from reality, this exercise is futile. Instead of producing absolute nothingness, in concept it only creates a lack, a nothingness where there should be something. True nothingness evades language. Even now as I talk about it to you, I act like it's actually something, which is contrary to being nothing. But no shot we get very far this way. This is where Heidegger turns his attention to anxiety. A peculiar trait of human existence is that despite our awareness of our own existence, of existence in general, we find it impossible to understand what existence really is. When we examine being through the lens of our everyday experience, confront it directly, we fail. It's only when we suspend the meaning we've already given reality, go beyond language and reason, and watch as our so-called objective reality retreats from us that the traumatic truth of existence is revealed. Beings as a whole retreat from the nothing, but it is only through the emergence of the nothing that the true nature of being is revealed to us at all. Heidegger believes that this process is confined within anxiety, because anxiety leads us to question why anything exists at all. Why is there something and not nothing? But this isn't a question that you can ask to make yourself feel anxious. The eminence of nothingness causes anxiety, which also overlaps with the moment you ask the question. It's a visceral confrontation. You can feel, but you can't understand. Except, more than having described the paradox of nothingness in metaphysics, Heidegger has unknowingly foreshadowed what would later become Lacan's formula for the real. Zizek describes the real by calling it a fullness, an overwhelming presence, after our emergence into language and reality as a subject, the real is a lack, 
a leftover void encircled by reality. And isn't this exactly what we see in Heidegger's logic? The nothingness in Heidegger's equation is really the truth of being itself, the point at which the real of existence is most present. At no point do we personally encounter our personal annihilation in Heidegger's essay, only the immediate presence of being. Annihilation itself isn't important then, except as a crack in the texture of reality, a leftover fragment of the real. That doesn't by any means cheapen the uneasiness of this anxiety. If anything, it only goes to confirm that May's anxiety is her response to the real. It isn't ever outright stated, but May doesn't really know who she is. A lot of the game includes sequences where she's suddenly forced to explore her sense of self. While all of her friends have plans to move on from their childhood, May is initially stuck on how things used to be. But after she starts on the path that gives life to her anxiety, there's a space opened up for her to question what she believes, what she wants from her life, and ultimately, who she is. When she mentions at several points in her story the feeling that the people around her have their lines already written, that sells it. If other people have their lines already written, if their subjecthood has been exposed, surely she must be wondering about herself, too. How do you define her if you take away her lines, the way she's always already been understood? If she isn't the first Borowski to go to college, who is she? The thrownness of your existence revealed to you by your anxiety is also the thrownness of your position as a subject. In both cases, you are treated as if you've already chosen. You are always already thrown into existence the same way you are always already a member of society. When May finally spends her anticipated night in the woods, it's a necessity. She and her friends climb over the fence at the edge of town. They journey into the woods, past the crusty mining equipment laid out on the grass, and continue deep into the hills. None of her friends believe her when she says there's something out there. But even if they did, there's no way they could have imagined what they'd find. This first encounter with the colt couldn't go worse. May makes a noise. They chase after her. Somebody shoots, and she trips and falls. Hard. She spends the next however long in a coma while her friends hide out in Greg and Angus's apartment. A cult member sometimes watches them from the street below. But May soon wakes up, wanders all by herself to where her friends are nervously gathered, and then, when night falls, tries to limp back out to the mine alone. Of course, her friends run out to stop her from going alone, and they trek after her ghost, just one guy. The deeper they go into the mine, the more May begins to panic. It's here, it's here, she says, but she can't say what. She can't stop herself from going towards it, either. Cultists are waiting for them around the corner on the other side of a pit. But they don't plan on killing May and her friends. The hole, it turns out, is the answer to everything that's been happening. It's the reason everything's felt like it's falling apart. May's not the only one who's felt this way. The cult formed a long time ago in response to that very feeling. When the first two men found it, one of them walked right into it and never hit the bottom. The other man called his name, but he didn't answer. Something else did, except it didn't speak, it sang, and it gave him answers. You see, Possum Springs was dying. If he wanted to save it, he would need to sacrifice people to this pit, this hole at the center of everything, the eldritch god of the depths. They've sacrificed 39 people since then, but only people they claim won't be missed. Drunks, drifters, and delinquents the immigrants and lazy people who soak up their tax dollars while they work themselves to death. The pit is hungry. So, so hungry. It's been singing to May, too. She's one of the rare ones who can hear it, in dreams and in waking times. It's the reason for her fear of the future. And it's heavily implied that it's the reason for her existential episodes where everything collapses into shapes. But the cultists have got to keep sacrificing. The whole presents them with a false freedom of choice. Either they sacrifice other people because they choose to, 
or everything falls apart and Possum Springs rots away into ruins and dusty fields. There have been moments where they've gone without feeding it. Then some of the worst disasters the town has ever seen happened. Devastating floods and blizzards. This hole at the center of everything is very blatantly the real. The very way it's described calls back to how Zizek describes it. Within the confines of reality, the real is a lack, a void, or a gap. Instead of existing as a horrifying and repulsive presence, within reality, it is only felt as an absence. The presence of what lies at the bottom of this bottomless pit is still felt after it's been fed its latest victim. The thought that eventually they'll need to find another sacrifice weighs on the minds of the cultists constantly. But the god inside the hole only sings when it's hungry. Its presence is only felt as a presence when the cultists fail to stick to their routine. And this presence is catastrophic to reality. It means the end of everything. Possum Springs will only survive if the hole remains just a hole. A void that needs to be filled but never entirely will be. A lack of the god's presence instead of the alternative, anxiety-inducing lack of a lack. The cultists are pure ideology. What I think is really profound about the real is that reality isn't constructed in response to it, like a chess move you make in response to an opponent's. Social reality is essentially nothing but the antagonism. It's not a response, but the constant act of responding to the same impossibility. The real as a lack represents a kind of deadlock, a total standstill between us and the impossible in our attempt to overtake it. We never make any headway. The real sticks out of reality, but is also already inside of reality as its limit. The point is that reality is incomplete. It can never successfully incorporate its origin point into itself, and this failure, the pit that can never be filled, totally defines it. The ideology of the cult itself shouldn't be approached as what it presents itself to be, but what it represents. Curiously, their worries and concerns aren't limited to the whole itself. They're unashamedly vocal about how outsiders disgust them. The cult sees the people that don't quite meet the status quo as omens of the town's destruction, which makes them the perfect sacrifices. Drifters and meth heads aren't a part of Possum Springs, or at least the cult's ideological perspective of it. If they exist outside of the community, then they won't be missed by it, and their absence will allow for the community to continue to exist. Except, every part of that last sentence is wrong. This is, to a T, a perfect example of what Zizek calls the ideological fantasy. Remember how our lack causes us to desire objects that we think will be the thing to complete us? If there's something missing inside of us, then it must be out there. And so we go looking for it. The lack inside of ideology works the same way. Instead of looking at how the system is insufficient or empty from within, we take the position of lack and assign it onto certain subjects that we then can claim are the ones ruining everything. The flaws of the system are then understood as coming from outside the system as some disastrous external force. Every lack is a lack of enjoyment, total satisfaction or fulfillment. So when we paint others out this way, we behave as if they have the impossible enjoyment that we're missing. The things that mark these subjects as outsiders, a different accent, bodily features, culture, or a lifestyle, give them away to us as secretly possessing an obscene enjoyment at our expense. They have your enjoyment. And as long as they do, they'll continue to hinder you in your quest for the real thing, the real America, the real socialism, the real Possum Springs, whatever. We use them to absolve our conceptualization of reality of its insufficiency. Zizek doesn't stop at the fact that the other, a radically foreign being, doesn't actually have the enjoyment we assign to them. No, his ultimate position on ideology is much more extreme than that. The identity of our position as subjects is nothing but our negative relationship to what we view as the main antagonist of stable social reality. Without the outsiders the cult figuratively and literally use to fill the hole at the center of everything, the ones they claim are corroding away at the social fabric, there wouldn't just be something missing from within the social fabric, the social fabric itself couldn't exist. The cultists never actually save Possum Springs. They never really restore it to the way it used to be, 
the past form that lives on through their nostalgia, they're only always in the process of saving it. But the cultists aren't the reason Possum Springs is dying either. They're doing a terrible thing, but they shouldn't be accused for more than they're responsible. Rather than blaming older generations for the problems of the present, we should direct our attention towards the factor that made their ideology possible. We need to look at the whole itself. I find it really interesting that Disco Elysium, a game also about nostalgia, also about ideology, also has a hole at the center of everything. The Pale is one of the most interesting parts of the world building for Disco Elysium, but you can very easily miss it in a playthrough. The Pale, at its most fundamental level, is an encroaching entropy that swallows matter and leaves a traversable sea of nothingness behind. The border between the world and the Pale is an uproar of matter, the sight of which is compared to a great vision. But the Pale itself is featureless. There's no color, no odor, nothing to look at. People in the game's universe seem to have accepted the vacuum of the Pale as a natural geographical feature of their planet, like we treat the ocean. Shipments and travelers are sent through it constantly. Radio towers set up on every side project signals into it, endowing it with actual dimensions that assist with navigation. You have to be extremely precise when crossing into it. If you throw a ship in the wrong way, it never comes out. But what makes the Pale so unique compared to similar versions of this concept in other forms of media is that its entropic effects extend to all psychological, linguistic, and historical phenomena. Those who travel through the Pale for too long not only start to lose their own memories, they also gain the memories of other people, memories from anywhere in history. All points of data, even the thoughts in your head, are prone to violent distortion. The further you push into the Pale, the steeper the degree of reality suspension. Eventually, even numbers stop working. Nobody's ever made it further than that. It may be impossible. But the terrifying truth is that the pale is expanding. The pale outweighs reality two to one. There is more pale than there is matter, and that ratio is slipping. But even scarier is finding out that it's already arrived in Martinez. Here, within the rafters of this church on the coast, there's a two millimeter hole in reality. You find it there in one of the best quests in the game, in my opinion in which you help a group of teenagers transform said church into a raving nightclub. At first, it's only an anomaly of sound, a space where all other sounds are silenced. Their vibrations are unable to reach you here. In the chilly air, the only noise is an enigmatic hum. But once this space has been measured, its data transformed into a sound wave and played aloud on the raver's speakers, there is only silence. And then, a low hum creeps up your spine. Dust is violently kicked up from the floorboards as the air begins to vibrate. There's nothing benevolent about the sound. It twists your stomach into a knot. The rafters shake. Plasterwork from the ceiling collapses. And the illuminated color window behind you cracks. Tiny shards hailing from the vaulted sky like snow. It will devour everything. The others begin to panic. The speakers are shut off. The compressor too. Nothing works to kill it. The sound only stops after every plug is pulled. I will tell you a second thing. There is a hole at the center of everything. And it is always growing. I am seeing it. And you are not escaping. And now, there is only the hole. Eventually the choice comes where you can claim that this puncture in the world is responsible for all of the failed businesses of the doomed commercial area and for the failure of all ideology in Marnais as a kind of entropic historical force, the perpetual loss of the future. This two millimeter hole in Martinez is the exact same as the hole in Possum Springs. There is a lack inherent to every ideology, every desire, even every subject, as a point of central impossibility. It's the emptiness within everything. Lack fundamentally indicates that there's something missing, but what's missing never existed, so it's all futile, internally hollow. The hole in Night in the Woods represents the feelings of isolation and lack of fulfillment that both May and the cultists feel in Possum Springs. And the god of the hole is capitalism. To return to Benjamin's theses of history, he argues that hell is now. It isn't waiting for us around the corner if the system collapses. It isn't some kind of outside threat. 
Hell is the continuation of things as they are. So long as the present is in progress, the state of emergency is by no means extraordinary. It is horrifyingly ordinary. We live in a state of catastrophe always. Capitalism requires worker exploitation, class conflict, and unsustainable growth practices to continue to exist. The Pale is a tangible summary of these issues. The horror of annihilation that permeates throughout these games has very little to do with any supernatural forces. The impossible factor making everything else possible is capitalism. It's created the traumas that it relies on to continue to exist. The Pale itself is also man-made. At the very end of Disco Elysium, you have the opportunity to telepathically converse with an unknown being, and it whispers to you these words. The moral of our encounter is, I am a relatively medium life form, while you are extreme, all engulfing madness, a volatile simian nervous system, ominously new to the planet. The pale too came with you. No one remembers it before you. There is an almost unanimous agreement between the birds and the plants that you are going to destroy us all. You are a violent and irrepressible miracle. The vacuum of cosmos and the stars burning in it are afraid of you. Give me enough time, you will wipe us all out and replace us with nothing. Just by accident. There are many obvious readings of the pale as an analogy for climate change, but it also functions similarly to the nightmare of history, the specter of ideology. It's implied that it's literally made of all of humanity's past thoughts and feelings, the waste of human thought that the universe is unable to break down. The pale is the space between the two deaths, realm of undead past. A year ago, a designer who had done a lot of work on the world building of Disco Elysium released a document that outlined some of the Pale's lore that was only ever alluded to in-game. It refers to individuals known as magpies, who steal ideas from the future, an act that greatly contributes to the expansion of the Pale. The past steals the future away from the present, destroying more and more of reality. One of the figures who might fit this description in-game is Dolores Day, often lauded as the greatest human being to ever have lived. Dolores Day was an innocence, a sacred ruling figure that assumed power over all the known worlds when in office. Innocences are considered literal personifications of history. The decisions made by one are not decisions. They are inevitabilities. What would have happened anyway? Only accelerated, packed into decades instead of centuries. It was said that there was no need to establish their rule with force, because there would be no point. An innocence could not help but win. Dolores Day in particular was a beyond genius philosopher, dictator, and military tactician. She was the world's greatest and most powerful mystery. To her contemporaries, she appeared out of time, a messenger from the future of the species. Later, she was killed by one of the men in her secret service a young man who had come to suspect that Dolores Day was not entirely human, but something else. Something that had walked in our midst, watching us stumble for hundreds, if not thousands of years, until it decided to interfere, interfere in the course of our history. We were supposed to have come up with this ourselves, who was reported to have screamed at her before shooting her 22 times in the chest. Whichever interpretation of the pale were to believe, and maybe we ought to consider that both are correct, they hint at the same remedy. The only way to counteract the pale is to engage in the act of creating something new. That's the beauty of what happens at the end of the events taking place inside the church. You take that horrible sound signaling the end of time, that raging trumpet noise of an angel from hell, and use it as the bass line in the track blasting from the speakers. And then you dance. Not in spite of the knowledge that one day all of this will be gone, but because of it. The authenticity of that act actually stops the void from expanding. At various points in his career, Lacan prioritized different ethics that for him represented the successful conclusion of psychoanalysis. The first is the purification of all enjoyment from your desire. You have to traverse the fantasy, experience the void behind your desire. 
But later, between 1959 and the early 60s, Lacan devised a new ethical ideal, seemingly opposed to the first. Instead of pure desire, where the only thing you can be guilty of is to betray your desire, the only authentic thing you can do is to identify with your symptom. We must betray our desire so that we do not betray our symptom, betray our drive. In other words, the only true solution to our neurotic symptom is embracing the death drive as that which persists inside you even when prohibited. Drive precisely as accepting your symptom, circulating around it. Therapy for Lacan, Zizek says, reaches its end when the patient is able to recognize in the real of their symptom the only support of their being. In response to Arthusser, Lacan taught that interpolation always fails. We are never fully what we answer as. This played a part in the development of what he called the split subject. Human beings are always separated from fully understanding who they really are, in and of themselves, which leads to a compromised self-image. Conforming ourselves to what is acceptable for the position we occupy in society always creates a leftover part of ourselves that we're instructed to disregard. There's always a set of behaviors that are inappropriate for certain situations. There are certain things you're not supposed to do in the workplace, for example. These prohibited behaviors constitute the symptom, the strange taboos that indicate the source of your enjoyment. The individual is split, and it is this very split that connects him with society. While Althusser might argue that you are a social being in the sense that you identify with certain values or recognize yourself in a certain position in society, Lacan claims something else. For him, you are a social being precisely because you are always trying to be the thing you're told you are. Obviously, ideology is still a factor. I'm still being called by what I'm taught I should answer as. The difference here is that for Lacan, the entire basis of your identity is the impasse of your antagonism towards what is not a part of the position assigned to you. Sound familiar? It should. Zizek says the same thing about ideology itself. Not only is the subject split, you are only a subject because you are split. You can only be what you are if you don't entirely understand what it is to be you. Precisely when you try to be yourself is when you recognize yourself the least. Identifying with your symptom means being authentic to yourself. Because, as we all know, if you want to be yourself, you have to be authentic to what feels right in the moment. You can't afford to constantly worry about the other. This is why Lacan says that at the end of therapy, the patient should become their own therapist. They should be the ones discovering for themselves what they desire when the other isn't a factor. You must be the person you decide to be. And that's where we leave May at the end of Night in the Woods. After the cultists let them leave, they defeatedly ride the elevator up. Despite their conflicted feelings, there's nothing they can do. But when they step off, May's ghost grabs her leg out of nowhere. She kicks and kicks and kicks and kicks, but she only gets away after the elevator lever is pulled. It goes crashing down. The earth shakes, collapsing the entrance. And then there's only darkness. Seconds pass while she gasps for air. And then she bursts out into hysterical laughter. And then the tears begin to flow. But after a moment, she picks herself back up again, and the group finds another way out. She slowly limps through the ankle-deep pool of water, one soggy step in front of the other. The damp air coming from the surface clings to her face. And then she faints. The cosmic being of the pit hasn't yet decided to let her go. She finds herself floating in an indeterminate space before the jaws of a swirling mass of darkness as it swallows the stars. Except, May now has her mind made up. When it sings to her, she confidently talks back. She confesses that she's terrified. She's so scared all the time. And the fear hurts, that feeling like everything is over like it was over long before she got here, like it's gone before it's gone. But she gets it now. Even if she repeats the past, like the cultists did, it won't stop. One day, all of this will be over. But she wants it to hurt. When her friends leave, when she has to let go, and when Possum Springs is wiped off the map, she wants it to hurt. Because that means it meant something. This pleasure in pain that May commits to is the enjoyment of the drive, 
which recasts this powerful confrontation as the moment May identifies with her symptom. Her nostalgia is no longer what it used to be. Exploring Possum Springs to discover new character interactions is, in my opinion, the most enjoyable part of the game. Although May is very clearly not a responsible adult, at the end of the game, we see her transform this social malfunction into her greatest strength. She creates her own definition of what it means to be an adult. For her, being an adult is about connection. Night in the Woods is commonly criticized for its ending. The cult and the supernatural hole that it worships are said to stick out in a jarring way from the rest of the game. But, and here comes the, here's why bad thing is good actually of this video, I think that's the point. May's journey into the mine exposes her to the limit of her ideology, the hollowness of nostalgia. The real sticks out of reality, but is also already inside of reality as its limit. At the start of Night in the Woods, May and the cult are fundamentally the same and yet fundamentally different. They're both different positions taken with respect towards the same deadlock embodied in social conflict. She says the same thing at the game's conclusion. I understand them in a way. It's like fireflies around the light, and then the light goes out. What makes her different now is what she says next. When I fell off of the cliff, I had a vision of Possum Springs where everything was gone, and it felt awful at the moment. But now I realize that I could just build another house, move somewhere else. May has decided to hold on to what she has while it's still here, until it throws her off. Then she'll find something else, create something new. May isn't defying entropy like some have suggested. She's shifting her perspective to account for it. At the end of everything, hold on to anything. The goal of psychoanalysis for Lacan, synonymous with Zizek's journey through ideology, is not to transcend the symptom or to go beyond it, but to restructure our approach towards it in a way that addresses the deadlock it's built around. By traversing our fantasy, we allow ourselves to enjoy the bits and pieces of our enjoyment that are still available to us through our symptom. Zizek endeavors to make us aware that we live within an ideology, while also showing us that we cannot escape the ideological space. We can never overcome the split that makes us a subject. But identifying with our symptom means that we can be authentic in choosing who to be, and that authenticity enables us to craft a better ideological framework for our societies. We can decide our own fate by accepting where it's presently taking us. We can't go beyond ideology, but we can go beyond capitalist ideology by accounting for its limits. We can because we must. We will only achieve a brighter future if we let go of our tendency to hold on to old ideas and create something new. The eternal present of our day isn't just a lost future, but the potential for a new, authentic future. May doesn't know who she'll become in this new stage of her life, but it doesn't matter. For now, she just wants to have band practice. The end of our world may be right around the corner. Time may be out of joint. But that's the exact reason we ought to surprise ourselves and dance.